Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Nicole lewillier Fenton, and I work in UVM's Continuing and Distance Education Department. And I'm so happy that we have an amazing panel today to talk about an integrative approach to a healthy immunity. I'm going to dive right in because we have so much information to share today. And we have four panelists. We have one camera that we see um, Andrea, Dr. Andrea Fassati on it. But we're switching that camera out between Dr. Fassati and Kara, um, excuse me, Feldman Hunt. So we're just going to do a little switch. So at the moment, we have uh, Dr. Fassati sitting with us. Um, so we'll go through those introductions in a moment. We're going to go over integrative medicine, health, and self-care, integrative and lifestyle approaches for a healthy immunity and overview healthy eating in the immune system, East Asian concepts in immunity, UVM integrative health opportunities for learning and care, and we have so many resources for you today. And we also have an opportunity for your own learning as you participate in this webinar today. We have a digital badge for participation that we'll share at the end of the presentation. A few logistics. The presentation is recorded, so we will share this presentation out afterwards. Um, and all of the links that we're showing today, we will also share those post-webinar. So if you're seeing something that flashes up on the screen, uh, feel free to ask, you know, what was that link? But also know that we'll share those um, in a follow-up email within the next couple of days or so. So let's get to it. We have a wonderful panel joining us today. Uh, we have Dr. An Andrea Fassati. She is an integrative physician at Apple Tree Bay Primary Care and UVM College of Nursing and Faculty Practice. Dr. Fasadi, thank you for being with us. And then we also have, joining us kind of in the, in the lower right-hand corner, we have Emily Claremont. She is a registered dietitian with the University of Vermont Medical Center. We're going to get lots of amazing tips on how we can improve our nutrition from Emily. Robert Davis also joins us in the upper left-hand corner. Good afternoon, Robert. A licensed Hello. acupuncturist since 1999, and will walk us through some Asian medicine methods and how we can consider Improving our own immunity. And not on camera at the moment. Um, she's sitting in, at the, maybe she'll pop in here. We have Kara Feldman Hunt, who's hopefully going to just replace that spot here for a second with Dr. Fasadi. She's a program manager for University of Vermont Integrative Health. She's a national board certified health and wellness coach and leads our integrative health program at the University of Vermont and the College of Nursing and Health Sciences. So we want to start with. Um, just a, a definition, really, um, and really trying to ground in what indeed is integrative medicine. Uh, and we're going to start with Dr. Andrea Fassati. Can you lead us off and, and give, bring us through the information today? You're all set. I can't, we should hear you. Give it a try. For some reason, we're not hearing you. There it is. OK. Sorry. That's OK. We okay. weren't hearing you for a second. Let's, now we do. OK. So the short definition is that integrative medicine is the intelligent combination of conventional medicine and complementary therapies that are used in an individualized manner for each patient um, and that include integrative modalities that are data-driven and well-studied and what we do is we help patients to optimize their health and well-being. So looking at the list here of integrative modalities, it's a, a broad list without too much detail in it. But you can see a lot of the things that we do every time we meet with patients. So I will work on lifestyle approaches, and we're going to talk a lot about that. Also the safe and efficient use of supplements. And then mind-body practices. These are also things that I can uh, refer out to if patients want a more in-depth experience with other practitioners. And of course, I can refer for other um, complementary uh, procedures such as acupuncture, massage therapy, et cetera. I want to highlight, though, that at the base of integrative medicine is a firm foundation in conventional medicine. I am conventionally trained, um, and then some. And uh, also, we work with functional medicine, which looks for the root cause of disease and helps us really change the milieu inside of the patient so that with lifestyle changes and different modalities, we can um, have them have less disease and less, less difficulties and maybe even require less medicine. Next slide, please. Thanks so much. So 
Here we are in the middle of a pandemic, and that's not something I ever thought I would be saying to anyone, much less on a webinar. Um, but the very first response, of course, was to use our conventional wisdom. And we've done that really well in the state of Vermont with personal protective um, behaviors that we've all um, contributed to. And you can see this is data that's about two weeks old. And you can see Vermont's um, flattened its curve right in the middle there. We are the gray curve. And as a comparison, the blue curve is New Hampshire, which I believe is starting to flatten now. So next slide, please. So when I was thinking about this webinar, I was thinking about, you know, now what? That end of the Finding Nemo movie where all the fish have escaped from the tank, jumped across the highway in their Ziploc bags, and now are in the ocean. So they've flattened the curve. They're clearly social distancing. And at this point, the question is, what do we do? How do we help um, support our health and our immunity and that of our family as we begin to go back to work, as we begin to open businesses and interact a little more um, regularly with other people? And this is a place where integrative medicine absolutely shines, because all of those modalities that we mentioned before broadly are detailed a little bit more here. Um, but they can all be used for self-care. And self-care is a cornerstone of integrative health and integrative well-being. So you can kind of choose anything from this and start anywhere. Um, and that's the beauty of integrative medicine. And why is self-care so important? Well, in a nutshell, self-care helps build resilience, which is our body's ability to recover from stressors, whether those are physical, mental, emotional, or even societal or cultural stressors. We all have a, an ability to be resilient, and by using these modalities, we can improve our resilience. And the same modalities that improve resilience improve immunity, almost um, one for one. You know, it's, it's, it's a beautiful relationship that goes hand in hand, where I really think of resilience as uh, Im improvement in immunity. And we have to remember here that we're in a marathon, not a sprint. And so these are practices that we'll have to put into place and continue doing for some time. So first on the list is exercise and movement. We know that exercise improves mood, reduces depression, anxiety, and even panic attacks. It improves our quality of sleep, and it can help reduce that physical stress that is part of the stress response, releasing tension in our bodies. In, in addition, it improves the immune response with the exception of sort of exhaustive um, exercise. So people who are doing ultra marathons or even people who have, for example, fibromyalgia and really overdo it may see a dip in their resilience afterwards and then um, it'll come back up to baseline. So what are we recommending for this? Well, in general, I would recommend moderate activity for 30 minutes or more as many days as possible. And this is very similar to the recommendations that you will see on the American Cancer Society or the American Heart Association. Um, and so it's, it's really a good practice standard. We know, though, that the most important uh, step is just becoming non-sedentary. So there was a beautiful uh, cohort study from the Women's Health um, Study. And this looked at older women, um, average age of 72, who were sedentary taking only 2,700 steps a day. And what we found was when they increased their step count by only 1,700 steps, so getting up to 4,400 steps, they reduced their mortality rate over almost five years by 41%. It's profound. If you could put that into a pill and take it, everybody would be doing it. So I cannot um, express enough the importance of just getting out and exercising. Next slide, please. So we are so fortunate here in Vermont because we have nature literally right outside of our door and we can walk and we can exercise in nature, which is a wonderful uh, thing to do. And I wanted to break it down a little bit because there's so many different components that are healthy for us. First, there's sunlight. And we know that sunlight offers us full spectrum light, which boosts our mood. And we see sort of the opposite of that over winter months when people have seasonal affective disorder and wind up needing more full spectrum light. Sunlight also helps our bodies convert um, sunshine into vitamin D through our skin. And then there's soil. And if we have a healthy soil in our gardens or in the uh, gardens of the CSA where we get our vegetables from, we will find a biodiversity of microbes that 
can actually help us. You know, there, there are traces of the soil, for example, uh, on our food when we eat it or when we're outside gardening or when we're petting our dog who's been rolling around in our garden. Um, we actually ingest some of these microbiomes and they can actually help promote a healthy immune response because they colonize in our guts. I also have noticed interviewing hundreds of patients uh, that they feel a connection to nature to something larger and that can be really um, reassuring at times of difficulty um, and as we're going through now. And then finally, uh, there is um, a modality, we kind of name everything, um, called nature therapy, also called forest therapy or forest bathing. And this was originated in Japan, but we actually have it here in Vermont. There's a wonderful practitioner here. And I love that they did some small studies on businessmen in Tokyo who they then brought to a forest um, refuge. and practice this forest therapy or nature therapy over the course of a weekend. And what they found was their natural killer cell activity. Now, natural killer cells are part of your immune response to viruses, so it's really important. Their NK cell activity improved after a weekend, and they could still measure that improvement 30 days later. So similarly, they took, I think, the same cohort of lucky guys, and they brought them there for just two two-hour walks in the forest, and again, found an improved natural killer cell activity that was sustained at seven days as well. So next slide, please. So get out and walk in nature is the message there. Yeah. Restorative sleep, um, sorry about the slide, I guess it was a little too big for its britches. Uh, restorative sleep is a foundational part of a healthy lifestyle and also it helps build immunity into our bodies. It improves our immune function um, from the first line, which is your mucosal membranes, okay, ability to fight off a virus, to the innate immunity, which is like your white blood cells, to even the adaptive immunity, which is when we make antibodies, et cetera, to um, the pathogens that come in. It reduces our risk of infection, having good quality sleep, and it also improves our outcomes if we have an infection or if we have a vaccination. So this is gonna become increasingly important as we begin to vaccinate. And the goal really is six to eight hours. Um, I would put a little plug in here for keeping a good sleep-wake cycle and healthy sleep hygiene because with our kids home and off schedules, um, it can be a little tempting to stay up late, et cetera, but it's really important to keep that natural circadian rhythm. It can be disrupted by stress, so when we go through times of stress, it can be harder to sleep. And there is an inverse relationship between our melatonin, which is a hormone that tells our body it's time to go to bed, and our cortisol levels which is a hormone from stress. So some of the things we can do to help with sleep would be practice mind-body uh, relaxation practices or even taking five milligrams of melatonin before bed, which may actually also have um, an antiviral uh, effect. Next slide, please. Rest and relaxation is part of all of this, and I would say that we all innately know that when we're super stressed out, our bodies are not gonna heal or fight off colds and flus very well. So important to remember to include relaxation response in our daily activities. And now is a good time to start if you haven't already. So whether you're home uh, with your family or home isolating on your own, whether you're going back to work um, and a little bit worried about that, or whether you've been on the front lines or are an essential worker the whole time, now is a good time to start practicing a relaxation practice. And there are so many modalities we can use. It can be simply sitting with a cup of chamomile tea, which is a nice, Nervine relaxant tea, it has healing properties of its own. We can sit in quiet, um, contemplation, meditation. We can even use acupressure points to help induce more of a relaxed state. Next slide, please. Hydration and nutrition. Emily is going to talk a lot more about this, but um, the most important part about this is that it helps protect our mucosal membranes. Now, again, the mucosa is the inside of our sinuses, our nose, our mouth, our throat, and our gut, okay? And these are all places where COVID or other viruses actually attach. So that's where the receptors are for their attachment. And if we have healthy mucosa, well hydrated, we're less likely to get a cold or a flu. We know this, there are big studies that show this, okay? So in the winter when it's really dry heat inside, it can be important to use a humidifier or to use a sinus rinse or a neti pot and so forth, but also just staying really well hydrated is of benefit. And then having a healthy plate, and Emily's gonna talk a lot about that, um, but it helps to build a healthy, healthy microbiome 
which are the healthy bacteria that live on those mucous membranes. And I'd like to just say that two-thirds of our immune response originates in our gut. So this is, it's more than a pretty plate. You know, it actually has real effect in our lives. Next slide, please. So botanicals and nutraceuticals, these are herbal medicines and natural supplements that you'll see. And this is probably the question I am most often asked. So I wanted to break it down into really simple um, kind of rules of thumb. First of all, there's many, many recommendations out there, many people making them, and none of these studies are directly um, on patients who have had COVID. Okay, so we just have to keep that in mind. We're making um, intellectual guesses, but they're still, you know, hypothetical in a lot of a lot of cases. Dietary supplements, and there are tens of thousands of them out there, are not regulated by the FDA. Okay, so you have to know your product. You have to be able to choose good quality products and know how to do that, or work with somebody who does know how to do that. I would also say keeping it simple is important. There are a lot of proprietary blends out there, and some of them are wonderful, but some of the ingredients in them, you know, if there's more than five or 10 ingredients, they may or may not be beneficial for you. You might be getting a little too much. And then I would say um, most benefit is really gonna come when the levels of the individual are low. So, so helping somebody, you know, improve their vitamin D level, for example, is gonna be best when it's low. And I use well-respected resources as, uh, that have published guidelines. We're gonna give you these links at the end of the webinar. So the Institute of Functional Medicine is one of my go-tos, as is the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine and Consumer Labs. And then the University of Wisconsin also has, um, I just saw it, just has a, a wonderful uh, kind of blog on this. Next, please. So most importantly, if I had to choose my top four, we're gonna talk about vitamin D is the sunshine vitamin is absolutely necessary for healthy immune response, okay? And it is super low in Vermonters and it is super low at the end of the winter unless you are a snowboard bird. It's going to be lower in the elderly and also people with dark skin. So that means that even if they're getting out into sunshine, they're not boosting their levels to the same extent. So my recommendations really have been that for adults who do not know their lab values, okay, with unknown levels, who are not supplementing, including not supplementing with a multivitamin, which will have vitamin D in it, I would recommend 5,000 IU taken daily with some food um, for about a month, maybe a little bit more, just to boost levels, to try to get you back into a middle range of normal or even a low range. Um, and then probably about 2,000 IU a day. This is more than the recommended daily allowance, but this is what I ask my patients to do. And if you're out getting a bunch of sunshine, you're probably not gonna need to do that. So then I would make these recommendations probably in the fall. Um, next slide, please. Vitamin C is another essential vitamin and it actually concentrates uh, in the white blood cells and helps them kill pathogens. Uh, we also know that it concentrates in adrenal cells, which help mount an immune and a, a, a stress response. So um, vitamin C is going to be lower in folks who are older and also in diabetics. And I hope that you're noticing the low levels are in patients that we've already identified um, to some extent as at increased risk. So older patients keep coming up here. Um, I would recommend, there's lots of recommendations out there for very high doses. I would recommend a gram a day and you're going to absorb it better if you um, take it over a divided dose. So 500 milligrams twice a day or 300 milligrams three times a day, something uh, in that range. Um, and that is again, higher than the recommended daily allowance. There is a need for much higher doses of vitamin C at some times during infections. And actually there are some ICUs that are using IV vitamin C um, for patients to help um, with some of the consequences that can happen with, with COVID. Next, please. And uh, finally, our mineral zinc. This is an essential mineral. It also is extremely important for mucosal health. And so it also can prevent uh, viral entry, entry into those cells in the mucosa. And it has really great data to say that it shortens the durations of colds when given early in a cold. So I am recommending uh, zinc be taken for my patients who wanna boost that. And I would say it's also, again, low, this went off, am I still on? It's also low um, in uh, older patients and in vegetarians. Okay, so I'm recommending 15 to 30 milligrams a day. Next, please. Last but not least is elderberry, and this is uh, an herbal medicine that's been flying off the shelves. 
it, um, is, it has some good data to suggest that it reduces the risk of getting sick to begin with. So there's some mixed data, but there are plenty of people who like to take it prophylactically, and that's absolutely fine. There is um, some question, and this is, there's conflicting opinions about this with the guidelines, about whether it can make things worse with COVID. So my recommendations for uh, an abundance of caution are you can take it preventatively, but if you um, begin to have symptoms or COVID or you test positive for COVID, or if you have an autoimmune condition, then I would stop taking it at that point. And uh, my final slide is just to encourage people to you know, get out there one step at a time, find the things that work for you, and keep working on your resilience because it will absolutely help your immunity. Thank you so much. Dr. Fasadi, thank you so much. So much great information, and I can't wait to hear how Emily can pull that together for us as well in terms of what are some of the things that we can be thinking about putting on that plate. And Emily, I know too that um, we've all been having to cook at home more uh, as a result of being quarantined. And food is a bit of um, therapeutic, I believe, too. And we've seen lots of folks, you know, um, baking more and the flour shortages that people were talking about. And so I hope that maybe there's um, some renewed interest in considering what it is indeed you are putting on your plate. So we'd love to hear from you as to how we can do that to build our own immunity. Okay. Thank you. Um, and so now we get to talk about that, that pretty plate. Uh, so our immune system requires a host of nutrients, just like what Dr. Fasadi was saying. Uh, and these, you know, these nutrients are to help our immune system function optimally. And this is exactly what we want. Uh, we don't necessarily want you know, a, you know, a boosted immune system, which is what we're seeing a lot of these days uh, in media, media campaigns. Uh, we want an immune system that works exactly the way it's supposed to. And uh, for that uh, to be the case, we, feed, we need to feed our bodies whole foods that deliver all of these nutrients that we need. And to ensure that we're getting all of these nutrients, it's really best to adopt a healthy, balanced, and varied diet. Uh, and what you see up on the screen right now, um, on the left is the Canadian Healthy Plate, and then the USDA uh, Healthy My Plate on the right. Those are two examples of what a balanced and, and varied diet might look like, as well as uh, Harvard's Healthy Plate model is another good one to reference. And let's not forget that we want to get everything that we can out of these foods. Uh, and so we certainly need a healthy digestive tract to, uh, uh, to be able to digest all of our nutrients. Uh, and so therefore, we also need a healthy microbiome. Again, what Dr. Fasadi was talking about. And uh, most most of the foods uh, that we talk about with regards to providing you know, sufficient nutrients for an immune system are going to be coming uh, from a balanced diet. And so similar to you know, what we were just talking about, that you know, we hear that it's important that we all, you know, that we get these whole foods into our diet um, so that we can have an appropriate immune response. Uh, it's also, I think, very important to talk about the foods that we don't necessarily want in our diet. Uh, and the reason why can be because they can increase inflammation in our body, not just in our GI tract, but throughout our system. And so inflammation uh, really is a contributing factor to many chronic health conditions, as well as uh, a poor you know, immune response. Uh, and so we often associate inflammation with, with bad, uh, meaning that, you know, it makes us hurt. Uh, sometimes inflammation or that pain doesn't go away. And it's true that if inflammation persists, it can cause damage to our tissues as well as to our microbiome. And again, thinking about that crucial piece of our gut being, um, our, butt, our gut being a crucial piece of the way that we're digesting and absorbing nutrients, we want to make sure that that stays 
as healthy and as intact as possible. And so these un, uh, unhealthy dietary patterns can certainly exacerbate inflammation. Uh, and these foods, if we you know, were to list them off, certainly things, big hitters, soda, candy, refined carbohydrates, high carbohydrate diets, high saturated fat diets, uh, and also to think about the, the nutrients that are missing. Uh, so low fiber, uh, specifically low vegetable and, and plant fibers from whole foods. Uh, so, however, inflammation is essential. Without it, uh, without inflammation, we can't heal. And so anti-inflammatory di dietary patterns uh, can support a healthy immune response uh, so that we can appropriately respond to incoming pathogens, uh, as well as resolve that inflammation and go about normal processes. And so anti-inflammatory dietary patterns, and I think it's important just for me to say that I'm saying anti-inflammatory dietary patterns, not the anti-inflammatory diet. Uh, but anti-inflammatory dietary patterns, and there are many of them, such as you know, my plate and the Canadian Healthy Plate that I showed previously. Um, but all of these dietary patterns certainly contribute to building resilience. And so this acronym here can be helpful in remembering why anti-inflammatory diets uh, are important. Uh, but they recommend reduce, or so they recommend balanced and varied nutrients. They encourage a healthy microbiome through beneficial bacteria, as well as short-chain fatty acid syn synthesis. They support a healthy immune system. They are foods rich in phytochemicals. They limit pro-inflammatory fats, refined carbohydrates, and processed foods. As well, anti-inflammatory dietary patterns inspire other healthy behaviors, essentially by you know, building the confidence in making healthy lifestyle modifications. They embrace uh, cultural differences so an anti-inflammatory diet uh, can certainly be modified to meet the traditions of peoples from around the world, perhaps even within our own state. Uh, they uh, are also nourishing and natural. Uh, I think you know, that was reflected by the previous slides. Uh, and essentially, you know, they don't necessarily contain anything artificial. As, uh, and as we might have uh, thought about from the previous slide, uh, anti-inflammatory diets, they certainly calm inflammation and positively change biomarkers of inflammation, which Dr. Fasadi talked about. And then lastly, they elevate health. And so I think it's important what Dr. Fasadi said in terms of, in terms of Dietary supplements for specific nutrients associated with our immune system are most beneficial when our levels are low. So when we call out these specific foods that are associated with our immune system, if we are trying to, if we are trying to establish the most optimal immune system that we have, it's important that, that first and foremost that we just focus on whole foods. And so I'm hoping that these next few slides can help you understand what foods are rich in these particular nutrients, as well as how we might be able to incorporate them into our, into our diets. Uh, so vitamin D, food sources of them, uh, and I will be honest, there are not many, uh, because vitamin D is certainly the nutrient uh, that we're mostly going to be getting from our environment, from the sun. So sardines, mackerel, salmon, these cold water fish, uh, egg yolks, uh, and with that said, I wouldn't necessarily recommend separating the, the yolk from the white. Uh, I would just say, you know, go ahead and eat the whole egg, uh, as well as mushrooms. And I'll just kind of call out uh, for, for sake of time that mushrooms, you know, a tip that we could do with mushrooms is actually placing them out in the sun, or perhaps even a sunny window for a period of time. So mushrooms actually develop, uh, they, uh, they create vitamin D similar to how we create vitamin D through their skin. 
And so it's a slightly different vitamin D than what humans produce, but it's nonetheless uh, a way to, to boost that nutrient content. Just checking my, my time as well. Um, so vitamin C, again, thinking about whole foods, just calling out a few here, kiwis, strawberries, broccoli. There are, I mean, there's many foods that are rich in vitamin C. And uh, sometimes uh, we typically think of more of our citrus fruits or fruits in general as being rich sources of vitamin C, but broccoli is, uh, is, is quite rich in vitamin C. And again, thinking of consuming the whole food, we're consuming all of the nutrients that come along with vitamin C in broccoli. Going back to thinking about wanting a, um, a healthy microbiome, broccoli is also a rich source of dietary fiber. So eating that, not only are we consuming some nice vitamin C, uh, but we are also contributing to our daily intake of dietary fiber and feeding our microbiome. I added selenium to this list as well, and partly, so selenium also has a, an important role in our immune system. Also, zinc and selenium come along together in a lot of food sources. Uh, so whether it's beef, oysters, shrimp, uh, I should mention that a lot of the sources of selenium and zinc are animal-based, but uh, a few nuts and seeds as well are rich in these, in these minerals. And so, you know, whether we're trying to uh, limit our beef intake or whether or not we have access to oysters, uh, which living in Vermont, we don't necessarily have uh, uh, a body of an ocean near us <laughs> to get oysters all the time. So thinking of like Brazil nuts, sunflower seeds, these are something that we can more easily obtain and um, just you know, a suggestion here that we can slightly toast these nuts and seeds. We can make our own you know, high selenium zinc nut butter at home and have this um, on a variety of different foods. We could also just eat them whole uh, as they are. And uh, you know, just before I wrap up, something that I wanted to say, uh, that uh, so with Dr. Fasadi talking about uh, changes since the pandemic, we're, we're home, our schedules are off, uh, and with regards to sleep, that it's really important to name that sleep hygiene schedule. I would say the other piece about balanced nutrition and healthy eating for our immune system is remembering to eat on a schedule. Just because our schedules are off doesn't necessarily mean that means that lunch gets skipped or that dinner gets pushed off until nine o'clock at night. Uh, that, that is equally as important to feed ourselves on a consistent time schedule. And so uh, this quote here was actually in uh, the most recent Nutrition Action Health Letter. And um, it says, if ever there were a time to eat a healthier diet, it's now. And I couldn't agree with it more. Thank you, Emily. Thank That's you. great tips. And I great think tips. back to your point about um, trying to keep on a schedule. As, as our schedules have been pretty much tossed out the window, it feels like, um, but being mindful of maybe having some of those things that you've mentioned in the snack pantry, um, because if they're there and readily available, you'll choose those sunflower seeds, you know, perhaps over something that might not be as healthy of a choice. So thank you so much for all of those great tips and connecting back to Dr. Fasadi's information. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from Robert Davis as well. So now we've been thinking about some of the things that we've been putting in our bodies as well. Um, and so I'm really curious to see what you can advise as to we start to think about the whole body as well from inside out and, in, and, and outside in. Robert? appreciative of having an East Asian medicine um, perspective being included today because I think it's always good to look at things from different perspectives and sometimes we we find commonalities and 
and um, redundancies, but we can we can learn from different different angles and different perspectives and and the points sometimes one perspective drives a point home in a different way so so um hope i'm I'm thankful for the the cognitive diversity I guess in the panel today, um which I think is always helpful so East Asian medicine um you know has a long rich history, and as an acupuncturist, you know we know that a couple thousand years ago, there were very sophisticated medical treatises and texts that have been preserved, and there was some really sophisticated thinking. Um, and while it didn't necessarily have the benefit of the scientific method and microscopes and blood tests and MRIs, they were they were careful and observant clinicians, and um, and and there's some great things we can learn from from these perspectives. And I wanted to start out by just introducing some East Asian perspectives um, that relate to the concept of immunity. So there's not a word in Chinese, in, in Chinese medicine that means immunity, but, but we have this concept of um, the bodies um, of Ying Qi and Wei Qi. And, and, and immunity is often sort of a, a balance of these things. Um, Ying Qi is sort of the nutritive Qi or the deep um, reserves of the body. So, um, and, that, and that needs to be healthy in order for the Wei Qi or the defensive Qi to rise to the surface and fight off an invader. So um, I, I often think of immunity as sort of this battle between self and non-self and how um, it's important for our bodies to recognize the difference, right? And, um, you know, we think of autoimmunity as something where our body has trouble recognizing um, external in pathogens and actually attacks itself. And I view that as sort of a, a hyperactive immune response. In other words, um, kind of like you have a security system and maybe there's a motion sensor and the motion sensor is so trigger happy that a little moth flies by and your alarm goes off right and it's like geez calm down turn that that detection system down so from an east asian medical perspective it's all about balance and you're going to hear me talk about balance today and how individual that is and that that there are absolutes about health that we can learn from, but often it's a matter of adapting things to each individual and helping an individual reach that, that balance. So the concept of nutritive chi often includes things um, that, that um, strengthen our, our core, like nutrition and diet and um, things that, that help us in that way, whereas the defensive chi um, is more that that's meeting a pathogen at the surface. And when we think of pathogens, you know, they didn't talk about germs in ancient China, but they used words to describe pathogens like wind, heat, cold, and damp. And when these things were excessive, they would they would invade the body. So, you know, a vi um, a pandemic is the classic wind, right? It 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 comes quickly. And it blows across the land and it might penetrate into your body. And it's been so interesting to watch COVID spread around the world almost like a wind, right? And, um, and then how does it affect us? Heat would be sort of the inflammatory response. You get a fever and you, you react that way. Or sometimes you get chills and you're affected in more of a cold way or dampness. And these are, these are just East Asian medical concepts that can be very intuitive and accessible to us when we describe a pattern of symptoms. Um, so I want to I wanna move along then and talk about how, how do we, how do we, I want to translate these things a little more specifically. How do we manage pathogenic qi? I mean, we really don't have any control over that or uh, or I guess I should say not as much control, right? These are things that are external to us, not internal. So we, can't con um, we, we can control the germs around us, and that's been what social distancing and cleaning and all those sorts of things are. But the point is you can't really manage pathogenic qi except for to avoid it, right? And so all the, all the things that we've used to get COVID under control 
in this early stage are really in that, right? Social distancing. Don't be exposed to the germs. Um, clean surfaces, wear masks, and, and all that. So clearly a way to manage the pathogenic chi. But how about this? How about these ideas of nutritive and defensive chi? Well, the nutritive chi, like I say, just from a 30,000 foot level, we would talk about making sure that our diet is neither excess nor deficient. And we look at this on different levels. It could be, am I not eating enough? Am I under eating and becoming malnourished? Am I eating too much? I think for most, many of us in this COVID crisis, if we're stuck at home, you know, overeating has been a problem, right? You, you hear people baking and eating cookies and things like that. Um, it's certainly um, understandable, but, but this, is, this is a pattern of excess. Um, and there's many different ways to analyze this as well. Emily gave you some excellent uh, ways to think about eating, but you know, we even in, in an East Asian medical perspective will think about, mm, is my diet too cold? You know, if I'm only reading cold raw foods all the time, how does that affect my digestion and my ability to absorb um, chi from our food? How about if it's um, too damp? You know, if all we're eating is Ben and Jerry's and rich, uh, foods or maybe alcohol. These are things that in, in East Asian medicine we, we think are damp producing and can cause damp patterns. So we, we kind of look at, I'm just trying to introduce you to these concepts and help you understand how maybe an East Asian medical practitioner, an acupuncturist, or um, someone who comes at things from these perspectives, maybe Ayurvedic or maybe um, other, other East Asian perspectives, um, might approach this. Breathing is often really inherent in, in these approaches as well. And I, I just want to take a pause here and say that, you know, I'm an acupuncturist and we get, um, acupuncture is a tool that I use for with all of my patients, really, almost all of my patients, unless they have an aversion to needling. But, but in, 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 the, in the East Asian medical perspective, acupuncture was considered one of the more inferior approaches. So things like diet and exercise and meditation and ancestors were considered more important determinants of health than acupuncture. Acupuncture came in when you had to sort of intervene a little bit more when, when we were not preventing and, and pathology had already, um, had already occurred. So, um, but I, I say that to, to say that breathing is often, um, you know, qigong or tai chi very much involves breathing patterns. And, you know, my colleague and mentor, Helen Langevin, has woven into her talks recently. Um, she's at the NIH now and talked about just how breathing can affect even your digestive system because of the musculoskeletal effects and movement and massage and how your diaphragm is above your stomach. And so there are actual, this isn't just, you know, in your head, right? These are physical, um, physical ways that breathing, for example, can expand your lungs or even affect your digestive system and things like that. Um, now coming to more the, the defensive chi, how would we look at defensive chi? What can we do from this perspective? So number one, let's Avoid the pathogenic chi as much as we can. Number two, let's make sure our nu nutritive chi is as strong as possible, that we're eating well, we're exercising, we're strengthening ourselves. But the defensive chi, um, like I said, it's all about a balance. And I, I mentioned this earlier, you know, is your defensive chi hypo reactive, like it's sluggish, like you have a low immune system? Or is it hyper reactive? Do you have an autoimmune response or do you have that hair trigger defense system that's going to launch the nuclear weapon, you know, based on a little blip on the screen. Um, so we're going to, we're going to decide that based on signs and symptoms of how you present to us or whether, um, whether you're hyperactive and, and um, red and we'll speak loudly or whether you're kind of sluggish and slow and um, lethargic. Um, so, but, but, and in, so we, we would balance and sometimes acupuncture and other, all, all of our, all the tools we use, whether it's exercise, nutrition, acupuncture, are going to be geared toward boosting or calming or establishing balance through a system of supports and interventions. Um, eliminating, um, eliminating stasis or per, 
promoting free, free flowingness. Um, I think of this, you know, when I think of resilience, the image that comes to me is bamboo. Bamboo should have, is, is this resilient, you know, it kind of like a bamboo is flexible. It's super strong, but it, but it flexes, right? It's like, it doesn't break in the wind. It's not a, or you could even think of an oak tree having deep, deep roots. So when there's a hurricane or something um, that it, it's rooted and it's, it, but that resilience is like the flexibility. Can you bend or are you just going to break because you don't want to bend at all? And, you know, under stress, oh my goodness, our, our, our lives have gotten so disruptive, haven't they, by, by COVID and, you know, our jobs and our families and everything's topsy-turvy. Man, that requires some flexibility. <laughs> um, we, have to, we have to adapt and, and, and uh, be resilient. So w that's how I look at it. And free-flowingness is a characteristic, right? If you're tight, if you're stressed, it's like, eh, you're, you're tight. And, and tension doesn't allow flow. If you're compressing and tight, you might not get as good a circulation or blood flow in your body. And relaxation, stretching, movement, exercise, this pr promotes flow. That's why when we exercise, we often, it's like we work out our tension, right? It's like it, it's dispersed, it's, it's circulated. Often people who are under a lot of stress, their hands and feet can be cold. There can be other reasons for your hands and feet to be cold, like your, you know, your yang chi is deficient, you're lacking enough heat. So that's a different cause. But another is you have plenty of heat. It's just not circulating because it's all constrained and constricted. So acupuncture, tai chi, movement, exercise, um, walking, all these things promote that free flowingness, which is great, great for helping your immunity and your resilience. So um, it, this might be a little redundant, but just to make sure we drive this home practically and it's not too theoretical, I just want to go over these again. So avoiding pathogenic chi, very specifically, physical distancing, dilution of pathogens. We've learned that fresh air is really important, right? Um, diluting that, those pathogens, those germs um, can, can reduce the transmission. Cleaning surfaces, so avoiding that pathogenic chi, it, it makes sense. Balancing our nutritive chi, diet neither excess nor deficient. I mentioned some of this earlier, avoiding overeating, avoiding excess, like too much alcohol. A little bit of alcohol might help us be re resilient and relaxed and chi flow, but too much, it's dampening, it, 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 it's dispersing, and it's negative. Um, staying hydrated, um, uh, Andrea already talked about this. Um, uh, it's, it's the basics, right? And having a balanced diet, like Emily talked about. Breathing fully, aerating your lungs, um, these are really simple ways to build that nutritive chi, which is inside, and supports the defensive chi, which is our defense system. So, um, moving to the balancing the defensive chi, once again, a little bit of, rev of a review. If you're hypo-reactive, and just to go into that a little more, you know, sluggish, depressed, cold, well, you would want to be cautious with sedatives, right? You'd want to be cautious with alcohol, which is kind of a depressant. You'd want to avoid overeating because all these are things that pr promote sluggishness and hyporeaction. You'd want to increase stimulation. You'd want to increase movement, exercise, warming, and circulating activities, even spice, certain spices in the diet, things like cinnamon and um, cardamom and things that have an aromatic uh, thing that can help move. Th that's how you want to treat a pattern that is hypo-reactive. If you're hyper-reactive, oh, these are the people that are prone to overdoing it. They don't sit down. They can't relax. They, they, they're always overdoing it. Maybe they're very anxious. They're hot. They're always flushed. Um, if, you, if that's your pattern, you want to balance that by being cautious with stimulants, um, sugar, caffeine. I mean, sugar is never a great idea, and Emily helped us see that. But especially if you're hyper-reactive, you don't want to put gas on the fire, right? Um, sugar, caffeine, spice, spices, these things that give us a lift and a boost when we're already too hyperactive, it's not a good combination. So increasing things that root you and calm you, that's where, you know, decreasing the, com the, the simple carbs, which are like paper on a fire, and increase the protein and the complex carbs, which are more like a dry log on the fire, right? It burns slower. Um, 
moderate and calming exercise things maybe maybe yoga or stretching or meditative things are, are a better exercise for you or walking while you're talking to a friend that relaxes you and doesn't make you angry <laughs> um, and things like stretching or slow breathing you know breathing at a certain slow pace maybe like four to six breaths per minute actually calms your system down Mindfulness is often includes meditation and and uh, breathing exercises and all that. The point is this is less dispersive and more consolidating. Um, and then finally, this is good for all of us, no matter which pattern we're in, hypo or hyperactive, warm or cold, eliminating stasis and promoting free flowingness. And the the metaphor I like to use is, you know, are you feeling crappy because to use a metaphor, there's a log jam in the river, like you have enough chi, but it's blocked. There's a log jam in the river. Or are you feeling crappy because you the water's too low in the river? So if there's no log jam, there's no blockage, there's just not enough water there and you're getting stagnation. Well, there's two, you know, unblocking a log jam is easier than raising the water level, and but there are different approaches and different ways to, to address the problem. So, um, so this is, these are some of the basic principles that you would be introduced um, in an Eastern, East Asian perspective of approaching some of these problems and specifically immunity and resilience. And what I would like to say just to kind of wrap up is just, you know, to seek help and coaching and advice from someone who helps you achieve balance. And that could be an acupuncturist, it could be a massage therapist, it could be a physician, it could be a counselor. Everybody's a little different, right? But the relationship is, is, I think, as important as the approach. That, that rapport, that trust, somebody who gives you wise counsel is just a balanced thing to have. And, and, and you want those people in your corner. Most integrative therapies help you to find balance. That's kind of how we're geared. So I just encourage you to find a practitioner and an approach that are a good match for you. Robert, thank you so much. Um, I love how all of this information is tying together from Dr. Vasati and Emily and, and Robert as well connecting all of these dots. So I really appreciate that. And I just before we get in and hear from Kara, I do want to recognize that Emily, I think you have a hard stop at two o'clock. So if you need to jump off, I just want to say thank you for the information that you've shared with us today. And I do recognize that you may need to go at two o'clock. Um, so I'd like to toss over to Kara Feldman Hunt. Um, we also have the opportunity to teach this information as well through UVM and the College of Nursing and Health Sciences and the University of Vermont Medical Center. Um, so why don't you walk us through what is happening in integrative health here at the Medical Center and the University? Sure, happy to. So um, hi, everybody. Thank you for having us, Continuing Distance Education. We much appreciate being here with you today. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick blitz of uh, what is UVM Integrative Health. Uh, we were established in 2015, and we um, are a collaboration among the College of Nursing and Health Sciences, the Larner College of Medicine, and the UVM Medical Center. I oversee the program. We have education and clinical programs, and we do um, get into research and policy. Next slide. Thank you. Next slide. Great. So um, we have an integrative health and wellness coaching program. Um, this program started in the fall of 2019. Um, it is offered to both undergraduates and continuing distance education students. We are accredited by the National Board for Health and Wellness Coaching. And our fall, fall cohort is currently full, but we are accepting um, students for our January cohort. And we, um, coaching is a, it's a great process, like Robert uh, alluded to coaches. Many different people can be coaches. Um, we're really uh, experts in behavior change. We do not uh, prescribe um, or give advice, but really um, kind of a, a guide on the side to help manage these behavior changes. Next slide, please. We have um, also a certificate in integrative health care. This is more of a general certificate, also offered to undergraduate students and continuing distance education students. Um, this really goes over the history, the philosophy, the different therapies and modalities that are included in integrative healthcare, and even why do we have this term called integrative health and medicine. Next slide. 
Um, we have a few different continuing education programs. Um, we have an Endowed Laura Mann Integrative Healthcare Lecture Series. And um, it's um, a series that we bring in three nationally known speakers a year. Um, and they are experts in the field. We typically have them present during uh, Grand Rounds. We also have an integrative practitioner forum. We have about five of those a year. Anyone's welcome, but they are geared towards practitioners um, for sharing best practices and ideas, and it's a networking opportunity. And finally, we have an integrative pain management conference, which unfortunately had gotten postponed because of COVID-19. So we um, now have a new date of Saturday, May 8th. I hope everybody will come. Um, and it's an opportunity to learn about non-pharmaceutical approaches to chronic pain. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Um, now I'm just going to go over a few of our clinical programs. Um, as you heard, the wonderful Dr. Andrea Fassati um, go first. She does integrative consults at Apple Tree Bay, which is our faculty practice at the College of Nursing and Health Sciences. Um, she hosts an integrative stress reduction group, which is a shared medical appointment. Um, and it's a learning site for undergraduate and graduate nursing students. Next. And we have a comprehensive pain program. Um, this program started in September of 2018 and is led by Dr. John Porter. Um, what makes us unique is that we have a pilot with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. They're covering an episode of care for our participants. Our participants are with us from eight to 10 weeks. Um, and they get access to many, many different approaches. Next slide. Uh, here you can see a photo. There's our great Emily in the kitchen. We have a teaching kitchen. And we have a yoga studio in our space. And we offer many, many different things at our program, including culinary medicine, yoga, Reiki, acupuncture. Robert is our acupuncturist in the clinic. Um, we offer massage, occupational therapy, physical therapy. Um, the list goes on. I know I'm, I know I'm not including everything. Um, and so I apologize. But we have a plethora of activity happening in our clinic. And, it's really a non-pharmaceutical approach to chronic pain, um, and it's been a wonderful program. Next slide. We also have um, integrative therapies at the UVM Cancer Center. We offer massage, mindfulness, acupuncture, yoga, healing touch, and Reiki. Not happening currently during COVID-19. Oh, go back, sorry. One second, Nicole. Um, at the Cancer Center, um, it, it's important to note that these um, therapies are for anyone who um, has can a cancer diagnosis, and they are free to the patient. This is all philanthropic funded. I'm going to do a quick plug for the Dragon Boat Festival because we are this year's um, recipients. And hop on a team. It's all virtual. Go to the Dragon Boat, Dragon Heart Vermont website. Okay, next slide. <laughs> Uh, we also have integrative therapies at the UVM Children's Hospital, um, which includes music therapy, mindfulness, and massage. Next slide. And we have an integrative practitioner network, which I um, really encourage folks to go find on our website. Um, it's a place where you can find um, a provider. So you can search by condition or specialty or area. So um, in this slide, I'm showing you Kirsten Wiley, who is our massage therapist in the, UV, in the cancer center. Um, and then from her profile, you can see if they are vetted and credentialed to work at the UVM Medical Center, and it will take you to the website at the medical center where they work. Um, but it, it, it is not limited to UVM providers. It is anyone in the community who is an integrative practitioner. They do apply to be part of our network. It is a really fabulous resource if you're looking for an integrative practitioner. And next slide. And finally, I just wanted to share for anyone tuning in today, um, if you are a UVM or a UVM MC employee, you have access to the Academic Consortium for Integrative Medicine and Health. I highly recommend um, checking it out. They have fabulous webinars. If you like this one, you can get more there. Um, and it's free to you because we are members of that institution. I think that's my last slide, Nicole. Thank you. Sorry I went Thank so fast. <laughs> that's okay. I know there's so much great information that I'm sure everyone's scrambling to write those down. So we will share all of these links in the follow-up email that includes the recording as well. And you can see all those wonderful links that everyone has mentioned here on these last slides as well. We will share all of these 
in a PDF that it will be accessible in our follow-up email. But I also wanted to share, too, that we've been talking about so much information today that this is an opportunity for you to show what you've learned today as well, our folks that are, are listening. We have a Learn and Earn digital badge for participation. It's something new that we've been doing with our webinar series over the last couple of months, and it's really exciting for you to add this to your LinkedIn profile, your social networks, to say, I learned all this amazing information today, and I'm so proud of it. So there's information there, and we will share how to claim that digital badge for participation in our follow-up as well. Our questions have come in, and thank you so much to our panelists for answering those questions in the chat box. Um, I think we're in pretty good shape. I know Heidi has been helping as well to share the questions over from our audience on YouTube. So I think we're in pretty good shape. I, we're at time, and I want to be respectful of people's time today because we all have uh, lots of things to get back to. I know um, Dr. Andrea Fassati is not on camera, but please extend our thanks to her and Robert and Emily and Kara. Thank you so much for your time. Your so much information to share with everybody and giving a little glimmer of hope that we can strengthen our immunity and make it through this very challenging time. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon, and we wish you good health.